Welcome back to Shoreline Conversations. We're in our series on organic disciples. Week seven in this series. Today we're gonna to talk about consistent community with Kevin Harney. Uh, Kevin, once again, glad to be back with you. And uh, uh, I think these are all tough. I don't do community well. So hmm. this is gonna be one of those, uh, yeah. uh, I lean into my introversion, I think probably a little too much. So yeah. maybe today I'm gonna to get some new uh, insight hmm. into what that is. Well, it's, it's interesting. I think it's fair to say that with the seven markers, and, and I describe the seven markers of spiritual maturity like a recipe, mm -hmm. all the elements are needed to, to make something the way it's supposed to be made. You follow the recipe. And, and yet, for different ones of us, certain ones are going to come more naturally. Like for me, you talk about Bible engagement. From the moment I became a Christian, came very naturally. Right. Passionate prayer. I love prayer, but prayer, prayer is something I work at. I have to be more intentional about. Mm -hmm. My wife, Sherry, passionate prayer comes very naturally. Bible engagement has become more natural over time, but it's taken more effort. So I think I think you're right. The, there's certain ones of these we go, boy, I got to lean into that. That's why we created the self assessment. Right. And for listeners, if they go to if they go to organicoutreach.org and find the self assessment, it's a tool to kind of see how I'm doing the different areas and identifying where I'm higher and I can celebrate that, and where I'm lower and I can lean into that. And mm -hmm. and if you do the assessment, you get immediate feedback with a bunch of links to. You know, to podcasts, to uh, sermons you can watch, uh, videos of sermons, uh, books, chapters of books, mm -hmm. resources help you grow. And so, um, if you know, and I've and I've got uh, a couple of different areas that I have to be way, pay more attention to, and other ones that just come very naturally. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, kind of grow where you need to grow. Yeah. We usually ease into this and ask a little kind of like icebreaker type question. I'm not going to do that this time. Mm -hmm. um, I think for some people, this is going to be a whoa kind of question. Mm -hmm. God is an example of perfect community. Yeah. Tell me yeah. about that. Like explain that. Yeah. That's kind of mm -hmm. complex and yeah. Yeah. deep. Well, uh, so so you get you give a complex deep <laughs> question, I'll give you a complex deep answer. Sounds um, great. so of of the world religions that are monotheistic world religions. So so of Islam and Judaism and Catholicism, Protestantism, some people put Catholicism and Protestantism together, yeah. but but you know, they would all say we believe in one God. The unique thing about the the Christian faith, Catholic faith, um, is that we believe in one God who exists eternally, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. It's called Trinitarian theology. We believe God, God is one in being. He is one being. But he exists eternally in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And one of the, one of the three ecumenical creeds of the church addresses this. Half of it is devoted to the, the unique two natures of Christ and half to the Trinity. But the Athanasian Creed uh, talks about how God is perfectly God, one God in being, and yet he exists eternally, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Each Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is fully God, yet not three gods, but one God. Mm -hmm. And that line comes up again and again in the Creed. Not three gods, yet one. And so, in a sense, God exists eternally uh, as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It is in this perfect, united, communal being uh, the, 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 the Godhead, the Trinity, uh, is this one God who exists in community. And so uh, in a very real sense, if you talk about, if you want to say, well, why is consistent community important for believers? Well, we're called to follow after God, and God exists in eternal community. God is not, not as just uh, one being who exists isolated, mm -hmm. but God exists in this beautiful uh, I would say incomprehensible this side of eternity I'll never fully understand the Trinity but I believe the Bible teaches it with clarity and so I embrace it and hold to that that God is perfectly God Father, Son, Holy Spirit not three gods but one and in this perfect community bigger than my mind can understand but but clear enough for me to sort of comprehend enough to say man that's pretty cool well I I appreciate what you just said because I was thinking man I don't understand that thing at all and mm -hmm. I've been uh studying this faith for a while, been pursuing yeah. it, been to seminary, like, I don't understand. Yeah. But if Kevin Harney doesn't fully understand it, whew, you'd be amazed. You'd, you'd, you'd be amazed at how much I don't understand. <laughs> I don't understand how a carburetor works, but I, but I, you know, I know it works. You know, I, don't, yeah. I can turn on the lights in my house and, uh, and you, I can usually get them to work, but I, but how they work, I mean, there's, 
tons. I don't, there's so many things in the physical world I don't understand. Why would I think that I would perfectly understand everything in the spiritual world? There's stuff that's just up here, but I, I can get enough of a glimpse of it to embrace it and, and, and see how the scriptures teach it. And, and where my mind can go, I can kind of see, kind of, but there's part right. of it that's kind of behind the veil of eternity that I don't totally understand. And I'm okay with that. And that's yeah. great. No, and I think that gives us permission as well to, we still want to learn what we can yeah. and figure it out yeah. to the best of what God's going to allow us to see yeah. um, without thinking, oh, I got to learn and yeah. understand every little bit of it. Yeah. So along those lines, so Jesus as God mm -hmm. is in perfect community, yep. but yet he sought out community with like us, normal people. Yeah. yeah. Um, why why would he do yeah, that you yeah, know if he's yeah. already in perfect yeah. community yeah i think it's easy easy for us to imagine okay if god left heaven and came among us the second person of the trinity god the son came to walk among us it's easy to imagine jesus as being aloof and distant and not needing people and absolutely you exist to worship me you exist but but yeah you read the gospels you read matthew mark luke and john and it's staggering the how much Jesus valued community and hanging out with the wealthy and the poor and hanging out with the religious and the deeply irreligious. Uh, and, and what's, when you read the gospels, there's, there's a couple things that, that should strike you about how Jesus related with people. One is that Jesus really loved people. And the other is that people really loved Jesus. Mm -hmm. People were drawn to him. He was drawn to them. And so, um, you know, why the why? Why would Jesus want to be in community with us? I, I, I don't know if I can do a great job of explaining that because I don't understand the heart of God. Um, but but there's a sense of his love for us, the love of the Father, the love of the Son, the love of the Holy Spirit, that Jesus loves, he loves us. And that was one of the most compelling things that drew me to Jesus coming out of this atheistic, uh, agnostic worldview, family, um, intellectual atheism, uh, kind of academic worldview. And I remember my first prayer was, God, if you love me and if what Jesus did is real, hmm. then you can have me. And it was a sense that, that he would want, he would want to have, he would want to be in a relationship with me. And I mean, from that moment on, it's not just been a faith system. It's not just been a collection of beliefs or, you know, an intellectual assent to certain doctrines that you check off. That's part of it. Mm -hmm. But it's, but it's been a relationship where I sense God's presence with me. Uh, from from that moment till this moment and every moment in between. Uh, why? The love of the Father, a love that, that doesn't doesn't totally always make sense to me. Mm. There's people that irritate me that I don't really want to be around that much, and sometimes I irritate myself and don't <laughs> want to be around me that much, <clears throat> but God always, even in my broken places, draws near, and that's mm. the heart of Jesus. And so I, you know, I can't fully comprehend or explain it, but I embrace the fact that, that Jesus, God among us, his name, that one of the names he was given, Emmanuel, God with us, mm -hmm. actually delighted to be in community with us. So, so he had Peter, James, and John, who are like these three really close friends, kind of this inner circle. Uh, my wife and I debated for years. She thinks that he was closest with John. I think he was closest with Peter. <laughs> so I think she was wrong and I'm right. But, uh, but, we've had, but we both have studied theology and both work in the church and, and we have fun little debates about things. But... But you know, close friends, and 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 then like uh, Mary and Martha and their brother Lazarus, who Jesus raised from the dead. This family that Jesus would stay with often, that he cared about them, he loved them. The twelve, the there was a group of seventy that were kind of like closer followers. This group of seventy, there were the masses and the crowds. There were, uh, you know, Matthew says, "Come on over for dinner," and and there's prostitutes and sinners and and tax collectors, and and Jesus goes there with his disciples, and the, and the religious people are going, "Why is Jesus hanging out with them?" And Jesus is like, "No, these are my people. This is pe I, I came for these people," and so we may not fully comprehend it. We may not even fully like the fact that Jesus likes people that are mm -hmm. so broken. The religious leaders of his day didn't like it. Right. Um, they had kind of thought, well, if he knew who they were, he wouldn't want to be around them. And Jesus' response was, I know exactly who they are. You know, and I love to be around them. Mm -hmm. That's the heart of Jesus. And so um, I don't fully comprehend it, but I, I, I stand in awe of the greatness of the love of Jesus for ordinary people. He wanted to, he, he, he wanted to be in community with us then and, and, we put our faith in him. He wants to be in community with us, with us forever. It's, it's staggering. Yeah. You, you talked about a few different groupings of people. You said the three, you know, Peter, James, and, and John. And, um, yeah, we could debate all day over, yeah. you know, who was closest to. And, but then they were three of the, the 12. Yeah. Uh, and then you talked about 70 and more of the crowds. 
when Jesus called disciples to follow him, yeah. he literally said that, come and follow me. Yeah. He yeah. said, let's be together. Yeah. Why do you think that was such an yeah. important thing yeah. for yeah. him to, to be with yeah. them and them yeah. with him? Yeah. Yes, yeah, he, he called them to be with him, to, to walk, to walk yeah. with him, to share life with him. Part of it, it would be a historical, cultural thing. Hmm. The rabbis in the ancient world, uh, their disciples, which just meant followers, students, uh, would hang out with them, would spend hours with them every day. And so, mm-hmm. so the part of it was that's what rabbis did. Okay. Um, but Jesus also uh, took it beyond that. There was a sense of he built this community among these. And if you look at it, it's, you know, you've got, a, you've got one of them as a zealot who was like this political, you, know, you picture this wild eyed, just, you know, you know, basically get, get the Romans deal with you. And then you had Matthew who was a tax collector who was working for the Romans collecting taxes from his own people. And what was common in those days, uh, collecting a little extra for himself or a sure. lot extra for himself. There were fishermen. I mean, it, it's just this eclectic odd group of people, but the sense of that Jesus loved people from all kinds of backgrounds. And he formed this community uh, one of them, Judas, who would betray him, mm-hmm. was, you know, uh, you know, we talked in the last podcast about beware of the love of money. Judas had a real love for money. And and so and, and, and there are things that he, you know, he sold Jesus out for some money. There were things that, that took him down a pretty bad path. But this this unique group of people, and yet Jesus bound them together and built them into a community of of his followers. And so Jesus still uh, did then and still delights to be in community with people. And it's mm-hmm. a it's a beautiful thing. Yeah. You did name a few different types of people. What kind yeah. of people did did Jesus like yeah. to be around? Yeah, if you if you read through the Gospels closely, you, you get the sense of just about everybody. You know, the the highly religious Jesus would come down tough on the religious leaders because they should have known better, mm. and they were students of the Scriptures, and they missed the prophetic words saying he was the one they were looking for, and they they kept looking past him or seeing him as a roadblock to their religious system. Uh, but but religious people and irreligious people. Uh, wealthy people and poor people. If you, if you read John chapter three and four and John chapter three, Jesus encounters Nicodemus, who is uh, part of the Supreme Court of his day, the Jewish Supreme Court. I mean, this is a guy of power, influence, uh, resources. The next chapter is with a woman in Samaria who's been through five bad relationships. She's living with a guy now. She's living in sin. She's, and she would have been a person who had very little to nothing. And Jesus, Jesus engaged with both of them. And so the, the, you know, the Bible just shows Jesus loving people, um, who were still spiritually searching and seeking and people who had already kind of arrived and everything in between, uh, men and women, wealthy and poor. Uh, one of the lessons I think of the gospels is that Jesus loved people from every walk of life, of every background. And that's a great word for us. Mm-hmm. We, we live in a time now that's growing more and more fractured and more and more disenfranchised and there's more and more conflict between people. And all the, to- all the talk of trying to make things equal, uh, it seems to me is driving more and more wedges. It's, it's a it's a weird deal because the people who are fighting and fighting for equity, um, it seems like people are becoming more and more polarized. And I don't know if I don't know how all that works, but mm. I know that Jesus. When I see people, and, and so a church like Shoreline, that we have people from all kinds of walks of life and different backgrounds, uh, and yet there's a sense of community. We are and our, even on our church board, it's a gathering of, of 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 leaders from all kinds of walks of life. And so when we hit a, and you've sat in some of the meetings where we hit a challenging topic in the last couple of years, which if, if you're listening to this in years to come, you know, <laughs> 2020, 2021, <laughs> lots of causes for division. We've sat down over tough topics and we've had people on different perspectives of the topics, but we stand unified together. Mm-hmm. We're like, no, we're, we're in this together. And we haven't had a single board member. I'm quitting. I'm out of here. We haven't seen the church get torn apart. There's been individuals who are like, you don't agree with what I like and you don't say what I want you to say the way I want you to say it. I'm out of here. But I'll tell you, that happened before COVID and it'll happen after Absolutely. COVID. People, right. people have strong feelings. But um, yeah, I, I really believe that God delights in, uh, in seeing people from every walk of life come to know him. And Jesus modeled loving people from about every background you could imagine. Yeah. I, I believe that the community isn't just for the sake of community, that there's yeah. more to it. Um, how would you say that the early followers of Jesus were, were a community on mission? You know, they had yeah. something more than just hanging out together. Yeah, yeah. yeah Jesus, was, Jesus was profoundly clear uh, again and again and again of what his mission was and what their mission was. When he called the first disciples, he said, he said come follow me and we'll hang out. 
No. no, he said, come follow me and I will make you fishers of people. We're going to go out and reach the world. We're going to share my love with the world. I'm going to put you on a mission. So it wasn't like a bait and switch. I'm going to call you to hang out. You know, you're, you're, you're a growing, more popular rabbi. Uh, we'll hang out with you. It's like, no, I'm calling you to a mission. And that mission drove all that they did. Uh, when he was together with the disciples, when he was teaching them, training them, equipping them, chastising them, encouraging them, blessing them, all that happened, uh, there was always a sense of there's somewhere we're going. Mm-hmm. And uh, you know, Jesus, Jesus uh, the Bible says that Jesus came to seek and save that which is lost. He mm-hmm. came to seek and save the lost. And he invited his followers on that mission, on that journey. And so, uh, so the community of Jesus and his people are not just a community of people who hang out, uh, and particularly in our world today, we hang out for an hour, we sing some songs, uh, you know, we have a little bread and bread and wine, and uh, or a little bread and juice, and we hear a message, and we go on about our lives. It's an infusion of that mission of Jesus that continues to this day, and the mission hasn't changed mm-hmm. because Jesus hasn't changed. And so, uh, they, they, when Jesus called someone then, and when He calls somebody now, mm-hmm. it's not just called to salvation. It's not just called to a future state of being. It's called to engaging with Him right now in mission in community with His people, and that's that's exciting. Well, and how do we go about doing that? How do we become a community today, joining with with Jesus yeah. and and being on mission to to yeah. our world? Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I think first we recognize what his mission was. Um, his mission was to bring his message, to bring his love, to bring his light to all people. And his, his mission wasn't just that we would gather and sing songs. <laughs> his mission wasn't just that the church would um, kind of circle our spiritual wagons and keep the world out. Uh, his mission was that uh, we would we would storm the gates of hell, and, and and the gates of hell would not prevail. They wouldn't stand. They're, they'll be knocked down and torn down. And those that are captured by the enemy would know the light and the love of Jesus. We can't make anyone put faith in Jesus, but we can shine His light and show His goodness and invite people to be part of that. And so, so that mission um, continues to be the heart of Jesus. And and for those who follow Him, we we just need to say, you know, I'm in. And I'm going to take those steps. And for some people, it's 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 scary, mm-hmm. and that's okay. You know, Jesus. Another thing that Jesus said uh, uh, at the very beginning, he said, "Whoever you know, whoever's going to become my follower needs to you know to deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. You know, Self denial, willingness to die, and give up your pathway for the pathway of Jesus. It's like that's." It was like Jesus. Could you start a little softer and like, like you know, convince kinda, us, talk kinda, us kinda, into kinda, it, yeah, ease us in, ease into it. It's like no, this, this is what it is, and somehow that gets lost in the lives of many believers. It's like, well, Jesus has called me to get good church services where I can demand exactly the kind of sermons and the music I want, and God's, you know, He's called me to be a part of a group of people who, who get what we want the way we want it. And it's like no, He's called us to lay our lives down to serve, to share His love with the world, and that can be scary. It can make us nervous. It can stretch us. But Jesus says. That's the plan, mm. and so let let's get on this mission together, which is which is dynamic. It is exciting. Community uh, has people in it, yeah. and well, we're messed up, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and so in in pe- with people in relationships, mm-hmm. there's there's always there's pain, there's mm-hmm. challenges, there's complexities. Yeah. How can we look at Jesus and how he navigated that? Yeah. Uh, what can we see from from him and how he handled the yeah. complexities and difficulties yeah. of yeah. of relationships? Yeah, you you might think if if human beings were writing the scriptures and not the spirit of God, we would have we would we might have painted this picture of Jesus coming and just being beloved by everyone oh, yeah. and just everyone embraced him and there were moments where the crowds cried out hosanna and right. they threw down palm branches and there were there were moments but there's a lot of moments with tension with conflict with pushback uh, whether it's the religious leaders overtly fighting against Jesus or whether you know whether it's one of his own disciples turning his back on him uh, whether it's um, the crowds crying Hosanna, and then sh- a short time later, many of those same people crying, crucify him. Uh, Jesus experienced the the brokenness of humanity. Jesus didn't enter this world like unaware of what he was dealing with. I mean, he came to die for our sins, so he knew our sins. He knew that the deep, uh, dark places of our brokenness. And so, Je- but Jesus came in fully aware of that, not only to save us, but to be in relationship with us. And so, you know, Jesus models um, absolute love for people who are often unlovely and at times downright hostile. And he came, you know, uh, it says in Romans, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Mm-hmm. What, in the midst of our sin, in our darkest moments, he died for us. And so we look and say, that's um, that's that's the heart of Jesus. That's, that's how he 
lived and, and he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Mm. Yeah. Uh, community is, uh, I don't know how to say this, it's not just something we do. Like it's, I, I think as we look at the, the Trinity, the God, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, that this is like the design for, yeah. for the way things are supposed to be. That we, we're not, we just don't engage in community. Like we're designed yeah. for community. Yeah. Uh, what, where can you see in like the scriptures any kind of, of indicators or yeah. signs that, yeah. that that's kind of like hardwired into us, yeah. like that yeah. we're, we're meant for that. Yeah. Again, I would say for me, I'm an introvert, so maybe yeah. I'm not, yeah. but I think there's more to it yeah. than that. Well, and Keith, you love community. I, it's just with certain people at certain times. Right. And you also <laughs> love time. You love to go out for a good long run and not interact with anybody. Yeah. And that's, that feeds you, right? Yeah. Uh, and so I, I was talking with one of my sons recently, and he said, you guys, I'm getting a little bit older. My sons are all in their 30s now. He says, I'm getting a little bit older. He says, I find I like, I like a little more time alone. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and I said, I said, well, maybe you're starting to realize, and he's also, he's in ministry in the local church. And so I said, well, so now maybe you understand why I like to go out at times and golf by myself or even go see a movie if there's a good movie by myself. Mm -hmm. um, I love being alone because I'm with people a lot. Mm -hmm. But um, Did Jesus ever go by himself? He snuck away <laughs> and the crowds would tend to track him down and try to find him. Right. He, had, he, he had to actually make a point of early in the morning when other, you know, just kind of get away and, mm -hmm. and bit in busy lives it almost demands that we need that time to pull right. away. So there, there is that sense of quietness, of uh, and, and, that, and that God blesses that and that Jesus modeled that, but also engagement, mm -hmm. community, fellowship, whether it's being with a gathered congregation, a congregation of 40 people or a congregation of 400 or 4,000, but being with God's people to sing praise, to glorify him, to learn together, that's part of our community. Whether it's like Jesus was having a swell cluster of friends uh, that you're around. I've got a group of, a small group of friends that... Uh, all but one were, were Christians until this last year when the one who wasn't a Christian became a Christian. Mm -hmm. But we, we go fishing together. I'm not, I'm not big into fishing. We go fishing together and hang out for about four days. And you're, it's intensive time together. I love that. Uh, it's wonderful. And we're out on a boat together. We're sitting having meals together. We just are doing everything together in pretty close quarters the whole time. And, uh, and, and so, and like I said, all of them but one were, were believers. One of the people that was part of this group is now uh, had had stomach cancer and actually discovered he had that when we were on one of our trips. And one of, one of the guys who's a doctor said, you got to get that checked. This is mm -hmm. this is not, he was being told it was acid reflux. And he said, no, this is more serious. He found out he had stage four stomach cancer. And so he's with Jesus mm -hmm. now, but one of the other guys who wasn't a Christian has become a Christian. But that, that, that small community, that cluster of people, I think that God's made us to have a, you know, you can't be best friends with everybody, but you better have a few people that you connect with. And so Jesus had Peter, James, and John, right? Um, there were clusters like the 12. There were larger groups. And so, uh, you know, Jesus modeled it, but whatever Jesus models, we as his followers want to follow into. Mm -hmm. And so I think for every Christian to recognize that there's a part of you that's been made for community. Uh, there's a part of you that's been designed by the God of heaven who, does, who made you to not be alone. Even mm -hmm. back in the book of Genesis, when God's creating, and there's this, this, there's this kind of this image of, of Adam being alone, and God looks and says, it's not good for him to be alone. Mm -hmm. I'll make a, a helper suitable, suitable for him, somebody who can be a partner in life with him. There's a need, you know, that we're even in, in, our, crea in our creation of who we are, there's that need for community. Mm -hmm. So I think for all of us as Christians may say, I don't need as much community as you do, right. but I need community. And anyone who fights it and pushes it back completely, I think it's time to stop and, and just go, wait a minute, I've got to check my heart and see how God has made me. And maybe I I don't like being around people because I've been hurt and dam you know damaged by someone and somebody's been nasty to me. So I'm going arm's length, man, I'm going to mm -hmm. stiff arm anybody coming close to me. It's like, well, but you still have needs there and you still have a way that God's wired you. And so try to own that and step into it a little bit more. I think it's easy to come up with uh, community as being, oh, I gather with 4,000 people on a Sunday morning. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and there is something to that with, without yeah. a doubt. Yeah. Um, but I can also say for my life, and, and you're right, I do, I do want to spend time with the right people in the right yeah. time because the fact is that I can't get that in another setting. You know, yeah. like it can only happen in close relationships. Yep. Close relationships are kind of, it seems like they're, yeah. they're hard to build. Yep. Uh, and, it, and it could be just me yeah. uh, or it could be our time. Yeah. It could just be yeah. humanity. Yeah. Um, they just seem to be more and more complex. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but I believe, and I think you're going to affirm this, that it's still important mm -hmm. with the difficulties of relationships to stay mm -hmm. in community. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Why? Why? Yeah. Why is that so essential? Yeah. 
Well, I'll talk about the how and the why. You know, building anything is difficult. We live in a, we live in a time in history where a lot of people talk. Well, let's tear this down. Let's tear that down. And you know, building a, a good friendship takes time and energy. You can tear it down in about five minutes. Right. Right. Mm-hmm. Building a good marriage, huge time, huge energy. Mm-hmm. Um, building a, a healthy church, a healthy business, any creating and building anything um, takes massive energy. Mass. It, it takes a huge energy and time just to make something that's okay or adequate or mm-hmm. barely functioning. Whether it's a government or whether it's a you know again whether it's a church whether it's a family. To, to build something that, that's just functional and surviving is takes epic amount of work. To create something that's actually good mm-hmm. is so rare. It takes even more. And to create something that, that's, that functions really well, a, a great marriage, a great friendship, a, a great uh, a great community within a, a congregation, it, it's like it's such a rare, beautiful mm-hmm. thing. And it is so easy. You can, with just a few words or bad choices, you can blow something up mm-hmm. um, that's taken months or years or decades to create and to build. Uh, and so when it comes to community, we shouldn't take it for granted. And it doesn't come easily. The idea that oh, I, sh- I should you know, join a church or be, make, make a friend and all of a sudden, man, we're just like uh, heart to heart, close. And it's, it's like, no, it doesn't, it doesn't work that way. Mm-hmm. It takes time, it takes energy, it takes vulnerability it, relationally. And so um, I would say first to build community takes a lot, and, but it's worth it. Uh, beware of those things that tear it down, broken confidence, broken, broken trust, words spoken in haste. Um, it's easy to drop a kind of a, a little bomb into something and blow things up. Um, you know, like I said before, destroying things is really easy. Building things up is really, really challenging. Mm-hmm. And so before you, before you decide to start tearing down world systems or a friendship, recognize that, and I'll rebuild it with something glorious in five minutes. No, you won't. Oh, yeah. It'll take just as long or longer to create something that may not even be as good as what you had, what you saw and had before. Mm-hmm. And I've, I've been thinking about this topic, so I'm talking that that transcends lots of, of life. But in the in our relational worlds, um, you know, to, and within within the church, you know, people who say, "Well, I've been trying to be part of this church, but it's not a good church. The people aren't nice enough. People know this. I've invested a couple of years, but I'm moving on to find a church that'll be the right place for me." Mm-hmm. I want to say that the same people with the same problems are going to be at that church well no, it won't be the no same doubt. people but it's the same people right. it's the same stories it's the same challenges people we are broken and fractured people being restored by the grace of jesus being healed and put back together growing in sanctification so don't don't live your life thinking that um you know i've got it all together and if i can find other people that are just as good as i am <laughs> we're gonna have great relationships uh, and and so i i think i would encourage people to look at the idea of community as something that takes time and energy. Well, I don't really like community. It's not worth the time. It's not worth the energy. Well, it, it can be if you pour into mm-hmm. it. Well, what if I get hurt by people uh, along the way? I'd say, well, you're, you will be. You're going to. Bank guarantee. on it, man. Yeah. There's there's few things I can guarantee you in life, but I will guarantee you in every relationship you enter into, at some point you'll be hurt by the other person. Mm-hmm. Uh, all the three of us sitting in this room, because Thomas is over here in, in his uh, editing chair. Uh, Thomas, have you never, ever been hurt or had ch- challenges or... Uh, uh, Problems in your marriage? Uh, yeah, nope, never, never, never. Good. Okay, so per, so so there's per, there's perfection exactly. Yeah, and you got a great wife. We we know Megan. We love Megan. Agreed. Okay, yeah, <laughs> this is being recorded exactly. But 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 you, know, but you do. But but there's still you know you will hurt her. She will hurt you. It's it is an impossibility to be any other way. And uh, we've worked together for 13 years. And there's there's points along the way where we're gonna we're gonna lock horns. We're gonna bump heads, but you work through it. Hmm. And so. So know that it's difficult and know that there's going to be pain along the way. And, and if you're the kind of person who says, well, that's just not my thing, I would say, but it's God's thing. Mm-hmm. And so learn. And, and, and part of the way I believe that God actually sanctifies us and grows us and makes us better is through the challenges of relationships, through community. Community is not just for me to enjoy. Mm-hmm. It's for God to sharpen me. Uh, a, a good friend of, this, of Shoreline Church, Gary Thomas, uh, has written lots of books, but he wrote a book uh, on marriage called Sacred Marriage. And and the subtitle is something like um, how marriage can make you how marriage marriage how marriage is designed to make you holy more than happy, mm-hmm. and it's like well but what if my relational world was designed to make me more like Jesus and that the rub and the tension and the conflict that comes actually causes me to have to be humble mm-hmm. have to ask for forgiveness have to have to care for people even when they've wronged me. Uh, that grows our character and makes us more like Jesus. So that that's the journey of relationships is incredibly complicated, but it is one of God's tools to make us into His image. And uh, 
kind of interesting. We don't think of in our relationship, I think that there should be pain or difficulty yeah. to help us grow. Yeah. I mean, in other areas of our life, as, as you mentioned earlier, um, you know, about my running, you know, and wanting to run and be mm-hmm. by myself, um, there's pain in running, yeah. right? But I get stronger and I get faster in that as those yeah. are people are trying to build up their their bodies they're, yeah. they're going to break down their muscles and there's going to be pain and it's through that healing that mm-hmm. they get to mm-hmm. to be stronger yeah. than they ever were yeah. before and I, and I do see that in in relationships that that's yeah. a, a reality as well you, you talked about us we're gonna we're 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 broken we're gonna yeah. fail we're gonna let people down there's also another kind of power in this whole thing beyond ourselves we talk about god and his will and us and ourselves and i think often left out of the picture is the spiritual aspect is is satan um how do you see satan involved in uh, disrupting or trying to disrupt relationships and causing divides and and spiritual attacks that are out there I get the sense it's one of Satan's favorite things. Yeah. <laughs> it's one of his one of one of his most. Uh, I think Satan his tactics have stayed the same through history because they work. Right. And if you have a battle plan that works and you win the victory every time, then you kind of run with that same plan. And I think that Satan looks and says dividing people, creating conflict between people inside churches and outside the church, is when you see that division really percolating and really starting to come to the surface. I think you can know there's a spiritual battle going on. There's more than just the human battle. And I I've seen in the last two years. Uh, Satan tends to pile on. Mm-hmm. You know, he sees where something's going on. And he jumps on it. So Jesus is in the wilderness in uh, Matthew four and Luke four. Jesus is in the wilderness. He fasts for forty days, and then it says, and he was hungry. Well, yeah, after four, he was fully <laughs> divine but fully human, and so so Satan comes and says, turn these loaves into bread. His first temptation is he sees what Jesus is doing and where he's at, and sees that he's hungry and he's going he's going to leverage that. Well, I think Satan sees our culture right now and sees the potential for tension and division between people. Mm and is just piling on is just is utilizing that and so you name you name the area of potential conflict you you know you can go you can go where we're at right now you know you can go republican and democrat you can go vax and non-vax you can go mask and no mask you can go uh, i mean and it goes on and on and on and on and and so there's things that create that create differences there's different perspectives different outlooks uh and 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 yet the enemy takes, tries to take different outlooks instead of saying, hey, we may not see it eye to eye, we may not agree on this, but we can still be friends. I've heard more in the last two years of people saying, I will not be friends mm-hmm. with anybody who disagrees with me on this, where they, they literally will break off friendships, family members. Not to, I, I, As a pastor, I've talked to so many people in the last couple of years that come for prayer and they'll say, My, this family member is not talking to me. Mm-hmm. It's usually not these people not talking to them. It's usually somebody else saying, right. I'm not going to, I'm going to end this relationship because we disagree about you fill in the blank. Right. And, it, and that, that it wasn't like that at this level of intensity, two, three, four, five years ago, 10, mm-hmm. 20 years ago, it, the, the, people had, had, you know, squabbles, disagreed on things, but people could disagree. I can remember a time in the, in the political arena where you would you would hear these people uh, they, they they do this correspondence dinner you know th- mm-hmm. that is is a is a basically a speeches and a comedian usually doing a, a, a bit and you can see it on a, a very popular massive uh, a TV network NPR right I think it's NPR is that no that's not no what is it it's not NPR it's PBS 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 yes. NPR is National Public Radio PBS yeah yeah and. You used to have people come in and poke fun at the president and poke fun at the different people that were there. And it was sort of a nonpartisan, and let's just have fun. And, and then afterwards, right. everybody would have dinner and laugh and get along and you know shake hands. And, and, and the people really disagreed mm-hmm. and still actually got along. Mm-hmm. Uh, we, we're, see, we're seeing not a, a complete end to that, but man, it's, it's, that's, that kind of thinking has fallen on hard times. Right. And, and even to the point where somebody will say, uh, well, I, I can kind of see how that person, you know, so somebody's on their opposite sides of a topic. And they say, well, but I can see it from their perspective. I can see. And then people, they'll get attacked by their own people for even saying that person might have something to say yeah, absolutely. or might have absolutely. a mind or a heart mm-hmm. or be a decent person. And it's like, no, you can't say that. They're the enemy. Um, and, and I think that Satan is having a heyday with this kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. And so for Christians, as we've walked through some of the different dividing things that have come in the last couple of years, and Keith, you're on our executive team at the church here, so you know the journey we've been on. Um, we pull together, we talk, we pray, we hear different people's perspectives. We, you know, one of the things we try to do as a church is to hear different perspectives and say, we don't want to drive you away if that's where you're coming from. And so 
uh, we had a, there was a point where, and again, this is kind of in the world we're living in right now, but there was a point in this last year where there were lots of different people at different places with worshiping indoors or outdoors, wearing a mask, not wearing mm-hmm. a mask. Um, and so we were, at one point we were doing nine different kinds of services where you could be outdoors with social distancing for families. You could be outdoors in your car. You could be in, you could be online. You could be indoor in the, and I just remember the most we had was nine different options. And I had people say, man, that must take a lot of work to make that happen. I said, it's crazy how much work it takes, said, but it's worth it. Totally worth it. Because Absolutely. we love people mm-hmm. and we want, you know, our, our church mission statement is, is Shoreline Church exists to help as many people as possible become totally committed to Jesus Christ. As many people as possible from whatever background, because Jesus loved people from every background. Mm-hmm. And he, you know, again, you go back to John 3 and 4, uh, Nicodemus and John 3, woman of the well and John 4. Jesus didn't agree with either of them completely. Right. And he dealt with things that he disagreed with, but he loved them. Mm-hmm. And so I think the community of the church, I, I believe that the community of the church can be a witness to our world in a very unique way. Mm-hmm. That, that if we can love each other, even when we disagree and acknowledge, hey, we don't see eye to eye on that, but we love each other. Mm-hmm. We don't agree on that, but we love each other. Mm-hmm. And uh, a line I learned years ago uh, that, that I actually learned it from my dad. My dad was the kind of person who could really strongly vocally disagree with people and still oh, get yeah. along with them. But one of his lines was, he, somebody would share something, and he, he'd, he'd smile and say, you know, I couldn't disagree with you more. <laughs> like, I couldn't disagree. There's no way in which I could disagree with you more. But he'd say it with a smile <laughs> on his face, and it was disarming. Yeah. And he'd say, I disagree with you, but let's keep talking. Mm-hmm. Now it's like, I disagree with you. You're canceled. You're, 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 you're a non-person. Get away from right. me. Our friendship's over. Our family connection's over. That is, that is demonic to the core. Right. That is from the pit of hell. And as Christians, we cannot play into that, uh, into that agenda and into that, into, into that spiritual enticement. That if, because what happens is we start pulling away to, well, then I'm just going to circle up and, and tighten, the, mm-hmm. tight, you know, tighten the wagons with the people who agree with me. There's a term that's been used a lot in a cultural sense called the great sort, where people are sorting now, where churches and families are sorting based on their convictions about minute, detailed things right. instead of the big issues of life. Right. They've got so much stuff that they actually see eye to eye on yeah. that they just set aside. Yeah. Instead of all the things we have in common, all the yeah. things we agree on, there's this 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 thing. But there's and that. that. And that's going to be yeah. the one that divides. Yeah. I can absolutely yeah. see that yeah. Satan takes advantage of yeah. that. You know, yeah. It's heartbreaking. Kind of yeah. blinds us to, to yeah. all of the good and all of that, the agreement that we yeah. have there. Yeah. And this is on a grander scale that we're talking really yeah. with churches and large groupings. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's also tough to, to build like close, mm-hmm. meaningful, deep yeah. relationships. Probably some of this stuff plays into that, yeah. but how do you see, yeah. or why do you see that that's so hard to do? Yeah. I, I think it's because we, we forget that every human being is broken, whether they're Christian or not a Christian, there's a brokenness. If you're a Christian, you're being rebuilt and redesigned and, and uh, forgiven by Jesus. But it's a journey, mm-hmm. you know? And so I think, I think just we, I think we look for a kind of perfection for kind of this utopian mindset. If I can find the right person. I think that's why so many remote r- romantic relationships blow up. It's well, you know, I thought they were my soulmate. I thought they were perfect. I thought they were just what I was looking for. And they would meet all my needs and be exactly what I needed. Oh, I think they were, I thought they would wake up in the morning and their breath wouldn't be bad. And their hair would be <laughs> all in place. And I thought that, but, and, and now they're not that. And, and it could be with a friend. I thought they'd be this kind of, but they're not that. So I guess maybe I've got to keep looking to find that mm-hmm. person, that friendship, that that person to date, that spouse, um, whatever that is, you know. Mm-hmm. And it's like, just wake up. Mm-hmm. That person doesn't exist. Jesus is the only perfect person who walked on this earth and they crucified him. They nailed him to a cross. Right. They spit on him. They abused him. And he was perfection. Mm-hmm. You're not going to find it. You say, well, you're telling me to, to, to lower my standards? Yes. Yeah. Uh, you know, Absolutely. I mean, if, if, well, I would say, if your standard is perfection, right. lower it. If your standard is perfection for a community of people like a church, you better lower it. If your standard is perfection for a spouse, you better lower it. If your standard is perfection for a friend or a, a friend group, mm. you better lower it. Mm. And I've had those conversations with people who said, man, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about kind of separating from this person or from this group because I've, this has happened, this has happened, and it's kind of like, well, you've discovered that they're human that mm-hmm. they're fractured and broken right. and, and and it's different if somebody's like if somebody has like in a grotesque way uh betrayed you and attacked you and is damaging you i mean oh, that's a different conversation right. 
I'm just talking about people, Mm -hmm. our people. We're broken. And so I'm a pastor, and I will say from the pulpit, I will, I will remind people, not every Sunday, but, but often enough to keep it on their radar, uh, I'm still learning, I'm still growing. If you're looking for the perfect pastor, you got the wrong guy. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you're looking for the per- perfect pastor, keep on looking, but you're not gonna, you're not gonna find them. But I'm, I'm, I try to say to, to the Congregation of Shoreline Church, don't base your faith on me mm-hmm. and have your faith shattered when you discover that I can be a jerk sometimes. When you right. discover that my tongue can be really sharp and I can say things where I'm like, oh, I shouldn't have said it, and if I should have mm-hmm. said, if I was going to say, I should have said it better, or not now. This is the wrong time, the right. wrong way, the wrong. Sometimes I can do it the wrong thing to say, the wrong time, the wrong tone, the wrong. You know, and uh, and that's things I'm working on those things. Mm-hmm. And people who know me know I'm working on those things. But the people who are closest to me have felt the sharp cut of my of my tongue at times. Have seen uh, my I'm not. People who know me would say they say I'm not Mr. Sensitive. You know, I'm not like I'm not the most sensitive guy in the world. And I'm and I'm being very kind to myself when I say that. You know, I'm not designed that way, but I'm growing in that. Mm-hmm. And my wife's t- I've learned a lot from my wife. I'm way more sensitive than I used to be. But and so, so I would say for people, don't don't expect perfection. If perfection is your expectation, lower your expectations. Still, still look for great qualities and great traits in people, but right. but also you're gonna have to learn how to forgive. Mm-hmm. Because if you can't learn how to forgive, you're not gonna be able to be in relationships. If you can't learn how to forgive, you can't stay in the same church, you're gonna bounce from place to place. I've watched people bounce from place to place to place. Once they get hurt by someone, oh, well then I'm out of here. Right. And I remember I remember one, I remember two different families I knew. In both the cases, the husband, when he got hurt or upset about something or, or saw something that he thought wasn't just right, he said he was moving on. The, we're going to the next church. And I remember two cases where, where the wife said, I'm not going to the third or fourth church in like six years. Mm-hmm. I love you. I'm staying married right. to you. But I'm, every time you get your feelings hurt, I'm not moving on because we're just going to be moving on and moving on for the rest yeah. of our lives. Yeah. And, um, and so I'm not giving advice on how to have a marriage <laughs> and conflict. I'm just saying there's a point where they said, you're looking for something that doesn't exist. In those cases, it was the wife who recognized it and said, um, these these are these are really good people who are mm-hmm. really trying to follow Jesus, but no, they're not perfect, and and there's going to be hurt along the way. Let's work it out. Let's figure it out. Yeah, I, th- I think we miss out often on some of the good, yeah. and in relationships, in a, in a church family, uh, uh, in a job, in a neighborhood, in a school, yeah. because we look, and it's not even perfection. You know, I yeah. know you use that yeah. word yeah. perfection, even if we're looking at higher than is really attainable. Yeah. It doesn't even have to be perfect. Yeah. You go, I'm not looking for perfect. I'm just yeah. looking for A plus. I'm just looking yeah. for something that doesn't exist. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. And then we miss out on yeah. such such yeah. good stuff that's out yeah. there. Yeah. Um so then again, as I always say, practically speaking, like yeah. what what are some practical ways that we can take steps mm-hmm. to to increase community? Yeah. And I'm gonna say yeah. with other believers as yeah. well as people that are yeah. that are outside the church. Yeah. Because because our our community is a witness to the world, you know. And so I, I'll start with outside, and move mm-hmm. inside. I think we can build connection, community with people outside the church. First of all, if we would just could learn to lighten up a little bit, mm. you know, Christians, I feel like need to tell every person, you know, don't swear when you're around me, or don't do that when you're around me. It's like, why wouldn't they? If, if someone doesn't know Jesus, I and again, I grew up in a very secular background, and so I'm not offended by profanity. I'm not offended by, I'm not offended when people aren't Christians act like they aren't a Christian, right? But And, and so just so we can lighten up a little bit and not be uh, everyone's moral conscience and, mm-hmm. and, and feel like if somebody's not a believer, don't be shocked if they act like they're, they don't know Jesus. Um, what's shocking is that Christians filled with the Spirit can at times act like Jesus. I mean, that, that's <laughs> shocking that we can, you know, that's, that's a growth curve. That's, that's you know, mm-hmm. but what's shocking is not when people outside the church live like they aren't being guided by the Holy Spirit or directed by the, by the scriptures because they, they, they're not. All right. And so I, I think we, you know, if we're going to build relationships outside the church, we can, we can lighten up. I think we can, I think we can love people where they're at. Mm. Uh, there may be things that we disagree with in their lives, uh, but we can love people where they're at. Jesus didn't begin his conversation with anybody with this is what's wrong with you. And sometimes I think Christians feel like we need to kind of wag a finger and point out what's wrong with people. We can love people. Mm-hmm. We can, we can walk with them. We can build a relationship and over time, God may open the door for those conversations. And so we can be patient with our, sometimes our need of feeling like we need to show people how they should be. And, and again, don't expect a non-Christian to act or live like a Christian. And so those, and, and then, then I think just just not being so isolated into the church. Mm-hmm. You know, if, if, you're, if you're spending all your time around Christians and in church stuff, make some new friends. And I've had, I had people on staff here at Shoreline when I came who were really just kind of cloistered away and they were, they were just locked into church life and they had no relationships outside the church. And I actually told a, a number of staff people, 
get a life, go make some friends, mm-hmm. take some time, go out. And, um, and some of them have, have had profoundly different lives now that they've started to, to build relationships outside of the church setting. And, and, it's, and it's, they love it. Mm-hmm. And they meet some interesting, wonderful people, but some of those people get to see the light of Jesus shining into their lives, and it's beautiful. Uh, shifting to inside the church, I would say the biggest thing is, is learn to forgive. Mm-hmm. Um, if, if you can't forgive, you can't function in the church. I've been a pastor a long time, which means I've had a lot of chances to forgive people because uh, people mess up. And I, I just the other day, was uh, I reached out to somebody who has left our church because I did things wrong and I wasn't the right kind of pastor and I didn't handle this or that the right way and they had very strong feelings. And and I've been trying to reach out to some of those folks that I know have been angry at me mm-hmm. and that have kind of broken fellowship uh, and they may have found another church. In some cases, they, they can't find a church that's the right church right now because nobody does things quite the right mm-hmm. way as they perceive it. But I'm trying to make a point of actually reaching out and just saying, my door's open, mm-hmm. my heart's open. I'm not gonna press into you and not gonna pressure you, but I want you to know that if you want to connect or you know reconnect in our relationship, um, it's not you know. If you just gently push the door, it's going to swing wide open because I haven't slammed it. You pushed it shut, but it's not locked from my side. Mm-hmm. And so I think as Christians, we've got to be able to be forgiving of one another. Uh, we've got to, we've got to uh, again not set our our scope you know for perfection, but not even to say I expect have all these high expectations where you just know you you can guarantee you're going to mm-hmm. be disappointed. Uh, be aware of that and and take those steps in. So. Forgiveness uh, is is another tough topic mm-hmm. for people to talk about. What, yeah. what about the person who says, "But you don't know my story. You don't know what what they've done to me." Yeah. Yeah. So it's easy for you to say forgive. Yeah. Like they probably haven't hurt you as bad as yeah. they've hurt me. Yeah. Yeah. You pa- you pastors, that's part of your <laughs> shtick. That's part of your deal. That's part of your job. You tell people to forgive each other. But yeah. <clears throat> but if you, if you knew what I went through, you'd know why God doesn't think I need mm. to forgive this person. Uh, all I would say to people, and, those, and I've had those conversations hundreds of times. Right. Um, I, I, it's not like a script, but I basically, the, the, the heartbeat of what I will say to people at that moment is, I don't know the pain you've gone through. I don't know how you've been hurt. Um, I know the hurt I've experienced from people. And as a pastor, if you want to, if you want to, if you want to compare war wounds, um, we could play that game because I've had people be really harsh and nasty and mm-hmm. attack me, my wife, my family, my children. Um, people who say they love Jesus, say they're part of the church and have been on the attack. So I'll say, you know, I, I understand. I, I feel what you feel. Not, I don't know what you feel, but I feel it in my own life. Um, and so, but I'll say to people, but I'm not the one who calls you to forgive. Mm. I'm the one that points out what Jesus said. I'm the one that points out what the scriptures say. Uh, it's God who calls you to forgive and he does know what you've been through. Mm-hmm. He knows what you've experienced from beginning to end on the deepest level. And... He knew what it was like to be betrayed. He knew what it was like to be beaten and abused uh, and to offer forgiveness to those people, the very people, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they're doing. One of the words from the cross, right? Uh, and so I just say to people, it, it's not, I'm not calling you to forgive. Mm. God is. And I don't understand, but he does. And so take that step and begin down that road. And then that's the whole conversation about what's that journey of forgiveness look like. Is, yeah. uh, is it always easy for you to forgive? There's stuff. There's stuff. It, there's stuff that's taken years, you know. And there's stuff. And, and then there's things that I've forgiven, but I've only partly forgiven. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? I mean, I've for, you know. And there's times where I, I, I will all God, the Holy Spirit, you know, God, the Spirit will just lift up my heart. Kevin, you've forgiven that person, but there's this part here mm-hmm. that you haven't really looked at, and that you need now. It's time to go a little deeper in that forgiveness. Mm-hmm. So there's even things I think I've forgiven that I realized later I hadn't fully right. forgiven. It's a journey. It takes time. Right. Uh, there's some things that I've been able to just let go. Mm-hmm. And, but the big things and the more, you know, that, and, and maybe I don't, I feel like I've forgiven that I'll maybe see the person. I'm like, you know, there's, mm-hmm. there's, you know, there's stuff that comes up. So no, it's, it's, it's hard. And it's, um, and, and with the power of the spirit in us and with the example of Jesus, uh, we have a, we have a pathway to walk, mm-hmm. but I think it's hard every time. And then, and, and I would say too, that, that extending forgiveness doesn't mean you open the door to be hurt again. I was just going to touch yeah, on that. I, I, yeah. Forgiveness doesn't mean, you know, thank you may I have another it may mean I got to put up big walls and barriers I'll forgive mm-hmm. you in my heart I'll for, I'm not going to hold this sin against you I'm going to pray for God's mm-hmm. good in your life but no you are not coming close enough to me to do right. that again uh, there's times where wisdom while you're still forgiving right. wisdom says I have to have the right boundaries mm-hmm. yeah yeah, and, and that's part of this navigating the difficulty yeah. of relationships yeah. Yeah. and interacting with other people's mm-hmm. people uh, when, when we don't get along in the church mm-hmm. that sends a 
a message. It, yeah. it paints a picture. Yeah. Uh, what does the world see yeah. when when yeah. Christians yeah. can't get along with each other? Yeah, when one when one pastor at one church across town can't talk with the pastor of the other church around town. When a couple of family members who are both Christians say we're not speaking to each other, uh, it just stinks. Mm. It 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 stinks to high heaven. It stinks around our world, and so Christians, we've got to figure this thing out. Uh, we've got to figure out how to love people that we disagree with. How to how to understand that um, as Christians speaking poorly of another church, speaking poorly of another pastor, speaking poorly of other Christians. Um, breaks the heart of God and is a witness to the world, but it's the bad witness, and that's mm-hmm. the wrong kind of witness. And so I think the world the world sees Christians who can't get along with other Christians. My wife grew up in a community uh, in, in uh, uh, West Michigan where there was the Reformed Church and the Christian Reformed Church. <laughs> and the Reformed Church uh, had been around longer. It was the, the first organized denomination in the United States of America and, and still endures to this day, mm-hmm. although they're going through a massive split mm-hmm. right now. But um, so she was part of the Reformed Church. Well, you know, decades before a whole group left the Reformed Church and they call themselves, we are the Christian <laughs> Reformed Church. You can, you can, you know, yeah. you're the Reformed Church, we're the Christian Reformed Church. And they had three or four things they disagreed on. But, but there was a time when you know, all the Reformed Church kids went to the public schools. The Christian Reformed Church went to the, went to the Christian schools. And if a kid met and went, and the, these two groups, were they held the same biblical beliefs, the same doctrines of faith, and not only the, the three ecumenical creeds, but their distinctive Reformed confessions were the same. They did almost everything the same. They have the same last names. They live in the same community. They say <laughs> the, the, the same quirks and, and oddities of, from their background and, and some of their Dutch heritage. And they're like, they're, like, they're the same, right? Yeah. And they would literally walk on opposite sides of the street to school. Mm. They couldn't, they couldn't, you know, if, if a, a little girl from the Christian Reformed Church met a, a boy from the Reformed Church and they fell in love and we're talking about getting married, the parents were like, well, we're going to have mutants, you know, our children are going to be uh, disfigured <laughs> and strange because they're like, they're so different. It's like, no, they're not. And I think people look on and go, what, are, are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? And so I think that our, our conflict and our ability to, to, to um, keep differences apart and, and, and to not love each other well becomes the wrong kind of witness to the mm-hmm. world. And so why would I want to be part of this? Why would I want to be part, group, part of a group of people who can't even get along with each other? I think it's heartbreaking. Yeah. So what message do we send yeah. when we do the opposite? When, yeah. when, when the world can see like deep and meaningful community yeah. amongst Christians. What, yeah. Obviously it's the opposite, but what, what does yeah. that really yeah. look like? Yeah. Yeah. It sends a huge message. I think that it's one of the greatest. Uh, G- Jesus said, "They will know you are Christians by the way you love one another." Mm-hmm. The world will know you. So I'm a Christian. Okay, that, that's one thing. Oh, you love each other. I guess you are Christians. And again, the world has a sense of how we should be behaving as mm-hmm. Christians, even if they don't have good doctrine or know the Bible very well. They like, well, they those Christians should get along. They should like each other. I mean, they're all part of the same club, right? right. Um, and so I think there's a real witness to when we love each other well. And I can say this right now in our world is a perfect time for Christians to figure out how to not be petty and be quibbling about silly things to be able to disagree on, on non-central non issues that are not about salvation but just other you know to say we we are going to love each other serve each other cheer each other on that will be a witness to the world we have a chance to because right now there's not lots of examples of people who are showing us what it looks like to not agree but mm-hmm. to love each other and i mean really love each other but if the church can do that we can become a, a real Kind of to take that high ground of grace and love and understanding, even when we don't always agree, that can be an incredible witness to mm-hmm. our world. And I think Christians need to take take hold of this moment. Uh, the two places that I spend the most time are church yep. and my home. Mm-hmm. Um, we've talked a lot about in the church yep. um, how we can have community. Uh, how can our homes become yep. places of community yep. that ultimately do shine yep. the light of Jesus? Yep. Yeah, every home should be like a little mission statement, mm-hmm. uh, a, a, little, a little mission, a declaration of this is what it looks like to follow Jesus. And so uh, husband and wives who, love, who actually love each other and like each other and work at getting along. And again, no one's going to fault us if, if we have our squabbles and stuff. People go, no, that's life. But, but there's an enduring love for each other. My, my wife has told me, a couple people have recently said to her, they've been in class, I've taught her different things I've done around the church, and they'll go to Sherry and they'll say, do you know that your husband is really crazy about you? <laughs> and she'll she, go, I know, I know. And uh, she, but, but I am. Mm-hmm. 
Mm-hmm. And I love her. And I think that that says something. If people love their children and, their ch- and the children love their parents and, and kids learn to love each other. And it's, it's like there, there's the, uh, you know, the, the home can become like a little microcosm of the body of Christ of the church. Mm-hmm. And if we can love each other well, if we have other people who live in our home or roommates and, and, we, and we're Christians and we love each other well, we can become a, kind of a lighthouse right where we are. Um, in a dorm room on a, on a college campus, in a in a trailer park, in a in a in a traditional kind of neighborhood kind of place, where, where, wherever you live, wherever you are, if you can love the people around you who are Christians, it takes that that vision of what God's heart is for His people, and it gives a little example of it right there. Mm-hmm. People can, can look on and see it, and people are watching, and and, they, and I think that they they believe that Christians should really love each other well. And when we show that it becomes a witness. So I think home has become that microcosm of what the church should be. And sometimes is, sometimes isn't, but should be. We just spent a lot of time talking about forgiveness. And I was just thinking that's probably the place more than ever where Mm -hmm. you've got opportunity upon opportunity to, to forgive and to practice that peace. And I know as I'm a father of four, um, trying to make my kids do things. Yeah. It's really a hard thing to yeah. do, and it's easy to go, "Hey, just have everybody love each other." Yeah. Um, but I would, it just hit me, not just like for the first time ever, but mm-hmm. hit me again. Um, I can control what I can control. Yeah. Right? Like I can forgive, I can be loving, I can be caring, I can be nurturing, yeah. I can do my part. Right. Yeah. As much as it depends on me, I yeah. can live at peace yeah. with those others, others in my family, and I think that that. Yeah pertains to everybody right yeah. like you can control you and what you do in that environment yeah, yeah. and then just see what god's going to do yeah. Yeah. through that as you were describing that i thought about i and i we never do this with our boys but i've seen families do this they're fighting their con- there's conflict between siblings and they say okay you two give each other a hug <laughs> give a hug you're gonna say you're sorry say you're sorry <laughs> say you're sorry and so they go and, 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 right. uh, sorry. and, and, and i'm yeah. sorry and, and there's nothing there right right if anything, that's probably... I'm sorry you're such a rotten brother. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> but what if that same parent was off in another room and then they heard those same kids kind of start to talk and then they heard one say to the other one, I'm really sorry for what I did. Hmm. And they peeked around the corner as this one reached out and gave the other one a hug. The parent would go, <laughs> it's it. a miracle. That's, you know, it, it, right? that, that, that's what we're looking for. It's not this coerced force thing. So as Christians, as we're seeking to be God's people in the world and shine the light of Jesus, to love each other well, to forgive mm-hmm. each other well, not because God says, you two hug each other, right. but because we say, you know, I was out of line, I'm mm-hmm. sorry, and you know what, I, I own my part of that, and I'm gonna try to do better. And you know, when we do that, most people are pretty responsive. Not everyone, right. but most people. Yeah. We want the world to know Jesus. Yeah. And part of that is us being out there in proximity yep. with yep. them and, and, and those who don't know Jesus. Um, I also believe that God wants them here within our midst. Yeah, yeah. How can we open our arms, open our hearts to those who are far from Jesus and invite them yeah. into our community? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Christians, there's there's a term, uh, you know, that can people belong before they believe? Mm. Can we invite people in and just say, be part of the family? Uh, in some Christian gatherings, it doesn't feel like that's the culture, that's the way it is, but I think it should be. Uh, I think that people, I, I became part of a, a local church, Garden Grove Community Church, um, for months and months and months before I was, my heart was really even open to Jesus. I was there because they were cute girls. I was there because they did some cool <laughs> activities. Um, but they embraced me. And so I would say to people, invite people to, you know, to a small group, to a, to a church service, if, if that fits, or to a barbecue or to an event or to a women's thing or a youth thing. Um, and invite people around and hopefully they're going to see people who love each other, who like each other, who forgive each other, who understand that, that we're not perfect, but we, you know, we can see things differently, but we really do care about each other. And, and so I would say invite people in. And if there's somebody you've invited many times and kind of grown weary, maybe one more, maybe the next invite invitation is the time they say, I'd like to come along. And then also invite people, you know, if you haven't invited them into your home and you're trying to invite them into the house of God, invite them to your home first, get a closer friendship with people. And, and if somebody never comes, keep loving them, keep walking mm-hmm. with them. Um, it's not like, well, I asked 10 times, they won't come, so I'll go find another friend. It's like, you know, we love people because we love people. Mm-hmm. And we love them right right where they're at and uh, keep keep walking on that journey. And, and then just uh, see if God can use the community of God's people. If, he, if people come and join into a church service or into a church gathering, hopefully they're going to hear the truth of Jesus. They're going to see the presence of Jesus. They're going to see people love each other like Jesus. And that becomes just a witness that our community really, they, they will know we are Christians by the way we love each other. We got to love each other more and let the world see. I think that is a great way to end. Yeah. Um, this has been a wonderful time talking about community. And yeah. I'm, um, 
I think I'm jazzed. I'm I'm ready yeah. to to do this a little bit more, um, both on the one and one and on, on the yeah. bigger. So yeah, thank you, Kevin. And do it and do it in light of who you are. You don't right. have to overdo right. it. I mean, I don't do have to do, do it. somebody else, yeah. right? Yeah, but 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 you'll need those 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 long runs, those times. But but say God and and let my community be redemptive. Let it shine mm. the light of Jesus in the world. So thank you. Thank Great you, conversation. Kevin. Yeah. Beautiful. All right. Whether you're watching on YouTube or listening on your podcast app, make sure to subscribe for more. See you next time.